Greetings, everybody. It's great to see you again. Welcome to our 39th now town hall session. It is, as always, wonderful to see you. And we have a great session today. I'd like to thank our Society for Leading Medicine for making this possible, and especially our chairs, Waverly and Adam Peaks and Kristen and John Berger. Thank you all so much for uh, your commitment and your connection to our institution. You know, as I said, we have a really exciting session today, a huge turnout, biggest turnout we've had for one of these in quite a while, two very popular and I think common topics with uh, lots of questions coming in. We're very privileged to have Dr. Cindy Martin, who is our division chief. I got to read this because it's a long title of advanced heart failure, heart transplant and mechanical circulatory support. She's going to be talking to us about heart failure and particularly genetics around heart failure, uh, which I think is going to be a fascinating topic. Uh, and then we're going to see hear from Dr. Miguel Valderabano, uh, who is our division chief of cardiac electrophysiology, the electrical wiring of the heart. He's going to be talking to us about another incredibly common topic, atrial fibrillation, which I know uh, I'm sure affects many people uh, listening in and watching in today uh, and be talking with us about that. If you have questions, um, text those questions in, or you can do it directly in, in the uh, app as well. Um, but if you do want to use a text, text the word DeBakey <coughs> to 37607, and then you go through the process after that. Now, I got to set a little expectations. We had a record number of questions come in this time. We had 140 questions. So unless you all want to be with us for a couple of hours, we're not going to get to all of them. So we've tried to group them. We've tried to prioritize them. But... We also have, uh, back of the scenes, um, two really great people. We have Dr. Amna Ajaz, who is uh, one of our uh, heart failure fellows, and we have Dr. Stephanie Fuentes Rojas, who is an electrophysiology fellow. To put that in perspective, they're both people who graduated medical school, spent three years in internal medicine, probably three years in cardiology, so they could already be practicing, but said, no, I want to learn and be very specialized in heart failure, very specialized in AFib and both will finish up this year. So you got some experts on there uh, to answer many of your questions. So if you're not here and yours gotten to, that is a great route for you. So again, thank you for being here and I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin, okay. thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boone, and thank you um, everybody for joining us this morning. It is my privilege to kind of talk to you about a, a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. It's really the genetics of heart failure. And I think it's a really exciting time in this field right now because there's so much that's happening so rapidly. But before we get into talk about the genetics of heart failure, I thought it would be best to kind of take a step back and just talk about heart failure and talk about why it's such an important problem. So when we look at the burden of heart failure, I think it's staggering to realize that there's 6.5 million Americans um, who have heart failure and over 26 million people worldwide. There's almost a million cases, uh, new cases per year just in the United States. And if another really sobering kind of statistics is once we reach age 40, and may have passed that a few years ago, um, the lifetime risk of developing heart failure for both men and women is one in five. Um, and so this is a problem that's gonna affect a lot of people. It's also a very costly problem. Uh, it's uh, estimated that the cost of, of heart failure is going to reach $53 billion by 2030. Um, but the most sobering statistics is about half of the people who develop heart failure die within five years of their diagnosis. And so this is something uh, that our field is working very uh, diligently to try to improve. So again, kind of the big overview of heart failure, I think it's important that we just remember that heart failure is actually really a clinical diagnosis. Um, and it really is when people develop things like shortness of breath or their inability of their heart to uh, deliver enough blood and oxygen to their body and to their organs and their muscles to basically support their daily functions. Uh, this is can be because the heart muscle is weak or because the heart muscle is stiff. There are different classifications that you see here. There's also different stages of heart failure. And then, you know, our goal is to really go up to that stage A at some point to where we find the at-risk people or maybe even the people with pre-heart failure and be able to intervene in that area. Um, but right now we're really, uh, most of our therapies are focused on once people have heart failure um, and then even have other options when they have advanced heart failure. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about really the standard treatment of heart failure, but just need to say that there are a lot of medications that we have. This is just a little algorithm from the American, Card American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association that kind of outlines what we kind of follow to try to treat heart failure, both with people who are what we call weak hearts and people that what we call stiff hearts, the two main reasons that people develop heart failure. But unfortunately, even with the therapies that we have right now, as we talked about early, there is a substantial mortality of all causes of heart failure, um, with the average survival, of, again, being between that five and six years um, after their diagnosis. And if we thought that we may be immune to that or because, you know, our area, we're very fortunate to have uh, really advanced um, health care here in Houston and in Texas, this is just a little map that gives you the death rates um, per uh, uh, county across the United States. And what you can see is Texas um, in that south, you know, area is in a very high uh, death rate. And our Houston area has a you know, uh, around us also has equally large issues. And so something that is really pertinent to our current population. So when we try to think about, okay, well, how could we perhaps, you know, impact heart failure? You know, we have medications. Those are definitely do things, and with our current medications, we can extend life between six to eight years just by actually following if we get everybody on those medications. But can we do better? Are there other things that we can look at? And this is really where the idea of genetics and heart failure came into play. And so these are two interesting graphs where we look at why do people have heart failure. And if you look um, uh, to the left, and people who have heart failure, if you're over 60, a large percentage of these are from what we call ischemic cardiomyopathy, or people who have blockages in their heart arteries and have had heart attacks and have damaged muscles, but there's still a pretty large degree of what we call the dilated cardiomyopathy. And so these are patients who um, the heart muscle itself is weak um, for particular reasons. But if you really look at when we get to people who are less than 60, you see this dramatic shift where the vast majority of people with heart failure are people that just have problems with the heart muscle. And so that made us ask the question is, why is that? You know, is there something that's making these patients' heart muscle more susceptible to being weak? And so a lot of data had looked into that, and we actually found that when we go back and look and see of these patients who have this dilated cardiomyopathy or a weak heart without any other obvious cause, what we found is a lot of the times this runs in family. And so about 50% of people who have dilated cardiomyopathy have actually been shown uh, to have family um, that also have the same condition. And so a number of years ago, more than a decade ago now, we put into our guidelines that we need to start asking family histories. And so when you come to the doctor and I'm asking about your aunt and your uncle and your cousin, it's not just because I'm nosy, it's because I kind of want to figure out what's going on in the family. And is there a reason that there may be something that is, you know, predisposing um, our heart failure patients to develop heart failure? Um, and can we look and kind of determine that? The good news is, is we actually, when we put this into place, we found that if we did the screening and we identified people who were at risk, we could improve their outcome. And so maybe a lot of this is actually diagnosing them earlier, because a lot of times when you just have a weak heart, you don't have symptoms of heart failure. And remember, we, don't, we can't diagnose heart failure until you come and complain to us about symptoms. And, but we can look and find that someone's heart may be showing signs that it's a little bit weak or maybe showing some abnormalities on some of the testing. And so I think that's really what helped open up this treatment of potentially identifying things earlier. Um, but of course, you know, this was, okay, we found people who are at risk. We found that maybe they, we can find some of the genetic reasons. And if we look earlier, then maybe we can kind of weigh in, but is that enough? And so we now in the last, like I said, really couple decades have been able to dive deep into learn more about the inherited cardiomyopathies or the genetic cardiomyopathies. And those terms are interchangeable. So if you read things about stuff, um, they're really one and the same. And there's kind of three big kind of groups of these cardiomyopathies. There's um, a group what's called the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. And these are patients who have thick hearts. And so you can see here in this picture of how this muscle is really thick. Um, 
Then there's patients who have what we call this dilated cardiomyopathy. And we talked about this earlier as it's one of the leading causes of heart failure, especially in the young. And the dilated cardiomyopathy is actually the leading reason that people need heart transplants. Um, um, and so this is a, a condition where the heart muscle is just weak, the heart muscle may be stretched. You can think of it as just kind of like a, a, a bag of tissue that's not moving like it should. And then the third group is a, a condition called the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. And one of the main ones is what we call arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Um, and this is where there's actually abnormalities in some of the structures that hold the heart muscles together that predispose people or make it more likely for people to have irregular heart rhythms. Um, and what we've seen is that there's sometimes that there's different genes that are specific for each one of these. But as we're learning more and more that we realize that the same gene may cause any of the three. And that seems to be confusing sometimes when we're like, well, how can one gene cause the heart muscle to be thick or maybe the heart muscle to be stretched and dilated or maybe the heart to be more prone to irregular heart rhythms? But then we have to remember that we are so much more than just one gene. And so a lot of it we're learning is some of these interactions with different genes. But kind of when we focus on this a little bit and we look at, well, how frequent is this? Well, now we found that it's uh, up to one in 100 and, uh, sorry, one in 390 people may have inherited cardiomyopathies, but that's probably still very underestimated because we're, a lot of people may have just mild symptoms and they're not recognized. And then there's sometimes that you can actually carry the abnormal gene, but it not show up to cause a problem. Um, and so obviously it's hard to diagnose somebody just if we're just looking for symptoms, if the gene isn't causing a problem. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time, just kind of a brief overview about kind of these more specifics. And like we said, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the ones with a thick heart. It is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in the young, um, especially in young athletes. Um, about 50% of patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, have a family history of this. Can it be a, a varied course of how it shows up? Um, and there's about 25 genes that have been shown to potentially cause this, but most of them actually are caused by one or two genes. And I highlight this gene called MYBC, MYBPC3, just alphabet soup. Um, but I highlight this because we're gonna talk about this specific gene a little bit later when we talk about some potential therapies. One of the other ones that we talked about, again, this arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, it's a little less common. Um, this one you see more in boys than in girls. Um, and then about a fifth of the time that we see people who die suddenly from a cardiac cause is likely due to arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And this is a condition where the heart muscles die and are replaced by fat or by scar, and this does lead to arrhythmias. Again, now up to about 12 genes. Um, we can find it about 50% of the time. And again, one of the most common ones in this is a, is a gene called uh, PKP2. And again, we'll highlight that because we're gonna come back to that a little bit later as well. And then we already spoke a little bit about the dilated cardiomyopathy. About one in 2,500 people have this. This is again when the heart muscle just becomes stretched out and kind of become weak. Again, up to 50% of the time now we're able to find this. Um, this is the one where we have the most variety of genes. Um, that are commonly caused. And so like I said, more than 40 genes, they're identified, but what you see is these are really spread out. Uh, the gene called Titan, the TTN is the most common, but only does about a, a quarter. And again, we see a lot of these other uh, genes that can be there. So how does this play into our treatment strategy? How does this play in with what do we do with this? Well, you know, historically, we were only able to kind of work on when people had a problem. And so it was really down here when they developed heart failure, that then we started looking at using our medications and hopefully with the medications worked, you know, and people got better. And if they didn't work, then we looked at things like the heart pumps, the LVADs or heart transplants. But what we wanna do is try to maybe work our way up this. And ideally it would be finding people who have an abnormal gene and fixing the problem at the beginning. And so where are we in this continuum? So now we actually have, um, uh, therapeutics have been put in place to where we can actually move up a step. And so when we find an abnormal protein um, or this, that this gene made, that we can actually have medications 
um, that can that we use here at this step and what's even more exciting and coming down the road is actually can we even maybe edit or change some of the genes or use give you a copy of a gene that you didn't have or give you more of the good copy when you had the bad copy. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So one of the new therapies that has come out is a, is a class of medications that's called myosin modulators. And this is just a picture of kind of like a blown up picture of what your muscle would look like and how these little myosin heads and how the muscle contracts. And if you look in the middle, you can see what a normal one looks like. And what I'll have you focus on is these little green arms. They're kind of helping the, the muscle move down. You can kind of think about it as, you know, the train moving down the train tracks. And you need a certain number of them. But if you have too many of them, then the heart muscle gets thick and stiff. This is what happens in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And because of some of the genetics that we found, we actually have two uh, medicines that are in place now and actually are in trials and, and now becoming commercially available that will help break some of these bonds and so help put you back to the normal. We also have some genes in the dilated cardiomyopathy. Again, when your heart muscle is weak and it can't move, you don't have enough of the arms. And we have some medications that are also now in place that can give you more of these arms and help you move down the road. So this is where we use genetics to make a specific therapy, what we call a small module to kind of fix the problem. The exciting part is actually moving into what we call gene therapy. And this is actually happening. There's trials where we have gene replacement therapy. And remember uh, when we talked a little bit about those uh, genes like the PKP and the myosin uh, PCB3, this is happening where we're actually delivering copies of the gene into the heart to try to give them more of the normal gene to make it work. If you have an abnormal gene that doesn't work well, we're actually doing something that's called gene silencing. And so I can, we can give uh, another um, genetic engineered thing that can actually turn off the gene so it doesn't cause the problem. And what's really exciting is they're actually working with a condition where we can go in and find your abnormality that you have, where you have that abnormal copy and fix it. And it's called gene editing. And this is also happening as well. So all of these things I think is really gonna revolutionize the treatment of genetic disease, which makes it more important to learn more about the gene so we know what to fix. Um, one of my passions here, I've really been interested in this cardiovascular genetics for several years now, and we're working here at Houston Methodist to develop a dedicated cardiovascular genetics clinic, which we will have uh, physicians who specialize in all of these areas. We just touched briefly about the inherited cardiomyopathies, but we've got many of the other ones. It's going to be a multidisciplinary clinic, and we're really working to have a genetic counselor that will be there. A little bit challenging because of funding things that comes with our genetic counselor, but this is an area that we're working on, and hopefully uh, soon in the future you'll see this come to fruition. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a brief overview about the genetics in, um, that we have in heart failure. I know it just kind of scratched the surface, but hopefully it will uh, pique your interest and give us some things to look forward to in the future. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, fascinating. And uh, I know there's lots of questions out there, and there'll be lots more coming, coming through. I'm going to turn to Dr. Valderabano, who's going to talk to us about atrial fibrillation. Thank you. So it is a privilege to discuss... Um, a disease that is actually my passion and uh, talk about uh, some new therapies and almost everything you want to know because it's a long, long topic. So first we should start discussing what is fibrillation. Here in the left panel you have a normal heart. The normal heart is controlled by electricity. Everybody has this easy idea that the heart is a muscle, but to get the muscle to contract in a coordinated way you need electrical wiring. You can have fibrillation like in the middle panel uh, where the lower chambers are in fibrillation and that is really bad. That is called sudden cardiac death. If you have disorganized electricity uh, in the upper chambers, that is atrial fibrillation and that's what you see in the right panel. You see a lot of waves of electricity in the upper chambers that go irregularly to the lower chambers. A few things happen in consequence. Um, number one, the upper chambers are beating very, very fast, like 600 bits per minute that makes the muscle unable to contract, it just quivers. And I want to point out to this little pouch, I don't know if this, uh, I guess, the, the, uh, yes, there it is. This, this little pouch here in the left upper chamber, it's called the left atrial appendage. It's a little sac that in normal rhythm contracts blood in and out, but in AFib it quivers and blood can become stagnant. And that leads to one of the consequences of atrial fibrillation, which 
that blood that is stagnant in that pouch can form a clot. And if a clot forms, it can go to your brain and give you a stroke. So that is the problem number one that we need to address when, when dealing with atrial fibrillation is the risk of stroke. The lower chambers may beat very fast and irregular. And when they beat very fast, they can become weak and lead to what Dr. Martin just discussed, heart failure. So tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy or rapid beats leading to heart muscle weakness is a common problem of atrial fibrillation. Um, and most importantly for patients, it is very unpleasant to be in atrial fibrillation. You know, it feels like your heart is jumping out of your chest. This here is an example of what I was discussing. This is the pouch, the left atrial appendage, and you see a little ball uh, in the bottom of it. I'm trying, there it is. So that ball is a clot that formed in there because this pouch was not moving. This is a heart in fibrillation. You see like it's not moving, but the, in, in, in truth it's actually beating super fast, so fast that it, there's no meaningful contractions of the heart muscle. Um, and this ball, this thrombus, can leave the heart and go to your brain and give you a stroke. So bad things. Let me see. So why do we get into atrial fibrillation? So there's a component of genetic susceptibility, but it's very vague. It's very broad. It's kind of like having a big nose. Yes, it goes by families, but there's no distinct gene that is associated with atrial fibrillation. There's some work in, in big genetic studies that point to some genes, but no distinct gene causes atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of uh, acquired factors that can lead to atrial fibrillation, and one that is very common is sleep apnea. Probably one of the first questions I ask my patients when they come to see me for atrial fibrillation, do you snore at night? And they look at me, what, are you, what is this guy talking about, snoring? Well, when you snore, one thing is snoring and the other thing is having sleep apnea. When you have sleep apnea, you stop breathing, your oxygen goes down, that, uh, your CO2 goes up in the blood, that causes tremendous problems inside the heart. Pressures change, the upper chambers start stretching, the pulmonary arteries, so the arteries that take blood to the lungs get uh, higher pressures. It's actually quite a stress. It's as if someone is choking you uh, when you have these uh, sleep apnea episodes. And that can change the anatomy and the physiology of the upper chambers in a way that can lead to sleep apnea. So apnea increases the AFib risk. However, and this is addressing one of the questions that I read earlier, apnea treatment, however, it doesn't impact atrial fibrillation. It's kind of puzzling. I think it's, it's, the way to think about it is apnea leads to atrial fibrillation, but once you have atrial fibrillation, it's its own problem. It runs independently. You can fix the apnea. You need to fix the apnea, but that may not affect atrial fibrillation. Once you have it, that's it. Obesity is a very common associated factor with atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of hypotheses as to how this happens. There's fat. When you're, when you're obese, it's not just your body fat that you can see here in your tummy. It's the fat around the heart is also increased, and that can create a pro-inflammatory uh, uh, environment in the, in the upper chambers that can lead to atrial fibrillation. And also, of course, uh, obesity associated with sleep apnea and hypertension. So these things come together. Uh, one of the first things that I emphasize to, my, emphasize to my patients with atrial fibrillation is lose weight. It will be good for you uh, in, for many reasons. Alcohol is another player very, very consistently increasing the risk of atrial fibrillation. And this one is, is one that actually can impact atrial fibrillation. So it's been shown in patients that have atrial fibrillation episodes and that drink alcohol that cutting back on the alcohol drink can actually reduce atrial fibrillation. Very common, and, and it's one of the things that we can impact on. And as little as a glass of wine can do it. Now, it's important to understand that there's different kinds of atrial fibrillation, like different flavors. The most common, the initial form of atrial fibrillation when it presents for the first time in patients is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is defined as patients that have AFib that stops spontaneously within seven days of its onset. And you may have episodes that last one minute, episodes that are like three hours, episodes that happen every week or every day or every six months. So that's why paroxysmal AFib needs to be also qualified by what we call the AFib burden. We quantify how much atrial fibrillation is happening. What's the percentage of time that a patient is in atrial fibrillation? And the AFib burden in patients with paroxysmal AFib does go down. If they drink and they stop drinking, the AFib burden may stop. You may decrease the number of episodes when you uh, cut back on the alcohol. Persistent atrial fibrillation is one that is continuous at least for more than seven days. Um, 
Long-standing atrial, uh, persistent atrial fibrillation is AFib that has been going on continuously for more than 12 months. Uh, these are incre increasingly challenging to treat because it's as if the heart settles in AFib. Atrial fibrillation causes damage in the upper chambers that begets atrial fibrillation. It's a very common um, <coughs> dogma in our field that AFib begets AFib. So the earlier you treat it, the better you prevent that process. Permanent AFib is what we call, uh, what we decide between the patient and the doctor that is, there's no point in trying to treat the atrial fibrillation and we need to concentrate on the management. So how do we manage atrial fibrillation? Number one, what the patients want is symptom suppression. They don't want to feel the heart jumping out of their chest. And that's, uh, that's an obvious request, but we also have to think of other things. We need to pre prevent strokes. We need to uh, prevent tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. There's some studies that have associated atrial fibrillation with increased risk of dementia. We don't know exactly why that happens. We think they're mini strokes that build up over time, um, but it's something that uh, we are actively, we need to treat and make sure that we prevent uh, dementia. Reducing mortality, we know AFib increases mortality over the long run, and we need to uh, show that we can impact that mortality by treating atrial fibrillation. And how do we treat atrial fibrillation? Few things, rhythm control means Let's get out of atrial fibrillation. Let's remove it out of the patient. Restore normal rhythm. That's uh, what we call rhythm control. And the second approach, which is more palliative, is rate control. Make sure the lower chambers don't go too fast and give anticoagulation blood thinners so that clots don't form in that little pouch that I showed uh, and we prevent strokes. So how do we do that? There are some drugs that can help. Um, of course, anticoagulation, if the risk of stroke is high enough, you need to be on blood thinners. And I want to discuss a little bit about ablation to restore normal rhythm, which is what we've been working on for the past uh, 20 years at Methodist. So ablation uh, of atrial fibrillation consists in different strategies. This is a schematic of the upper chambers of the heart, looking at them from the back. These little tubes uh, coming out of the back are the pulmonary veins. They connect the heart with the lungs. And there's usually two on the right side, two on the left side. And this is the area where electricity gets disorganized in atrial fibrillation. So those red circles that you see there are actually burns. We cauterize those areas with the goal to get rid of, a, of electricity from those areas so that the disorganized electricity uh, is eliminated and we restore normal rhythm. Be as you can see, there are four panels there because they're different strategies. And we try to kind of individualize ablation strategies for each patient. And that has become a, a, quite a challenging um, approach. But we know that each patient needs their own uh, different ablation. Everybody kind of needs the pulmonary vein isolation part. And then more ablation is done uh, depending on the patient's AFib. Um, this is an area that we've done a lot of research. And I got interested in this. Um, uh, in looking at strategies addressing the nerves of the heart to prevent atrial fibrillation. Why do we have nerves in the heart? Uh, well, they are there. And why are they there? We don't know, but we need to, well, the brain needs to be connected to the heart. Just like I'm sitting here, I'm nervous sitting next to Dr. Boom, my heart is pounding a little bit harder. Why is that? My brain is telling my heart, hey, this is a stressful situation. From the evolutionary standpoint, this is something that we all need, like when a lion is chasing us, we need to get the heart ready to fly or fight, right? And that is mediated by, by heart nerves. It's interesting that the nerves in the heart play a role in atrial fibrillation, specifically in um, apnea. And this is something that I got interested in many years ago, and, and we did some research study in experimental models here to show if we could tackle the nerves uh, of the upper chambers to prevent AFib, and specifically apnea-induced AFib. And I thought about apnea because some of these nerves uh, in the heart, in the upper chambers, are sensory nerves. They kind of sense what's going on in the left upper chamber. And the left upper chamber is the first chamber that gets oxygenated blood from the lungs. So these nerves sense how well oxygenated the blood is coming, how much oxygen is, is coming from the lungs and how much CO2 has been blown up. So when you have apnea, these nerves get angry. When they get angry, they get activated, start firing, and the patient may go into atrial fibrillation. So we did some experimental work trying to understand how this could happen. And we showed a sequence, uh, I don't need to bore you with the details, but we show how a sequence of activation of the cardiac nerves uh, happens when you stop breathing. Um, 
we actually found that there was a, a blood vessel, a vein, that, is connect, that connects with these nerves. This vein is called the vein of Marshall. It's a vein that we can reach uh, through, the, through the, vein, the big vein of the heart, and we can put catheters in there through the groin or through the neck. This vein of Marshall connects with the nerves uh, of the heart, and we figured uh, in 2007 I had this idea that I could inject alcohol in this vein. Uh, using a conventional technique, putting a balloon in there. And in an experimental model, it worked. And um, thanks to some funding that we got from the Houston Texans, we did some more experiments and showed that it worked, and we took it to the humans. And this is a human study where we're actually injecting, injecting contrast in the main big vein of the heart. And you see a little twig. Uh, let me see if I can focus this um, there. This little twig is the vein of Marshall, this line here. You can also see it there. So this vein connects with the heart nerves, and we can put a balloon, inject alcohol, and kill those nerves. Um, it seems like a very crude idea, but we showed after first showing that it was safe to do, that it helps patients. We did a large clinical trial that we published now three years ago and showed that it made a difference, that we could get better results in the AFib ablation when we uh, added alcohol in the vein of Marshall. Um, Okay, let me just shift gears a little bit here. You see a picture taken uh, from Central Market here in Houston. And this is at the station where they sell different kind of peppers. And you see on the top the Scoville heat scale. This is, this is a really, uh, this exists. This is a chemist, a pharmacist that devises a scale to quantify how spicy peppers are, how hot they are. And the hottest pepper ever is the habanero here. But there's chemicals that are even hotter. Capsaicin is one, and another one called resinifera toxin. So if you look at the Scoville scale of habanero, it's maybe like a, a thousand, like if I don't remember the units. Um, well, capsaicin is like a million, and resinifera toxin is a billion. So the, the hottest kind of chemical ever is so hot that it, it burns the nerves. It destroys the nerves. Your nerves sense it, and then they get hyperactivated, and they die. So we use this um, in an experimental model of apnea, and we showed that using this pepper-like compound, we could eliminate some of the responses, some of these angry responses of the nerves uh, during apnea, and showed that we could potentially prevent apnea-induced atrial fibrillation. Uh, this has led to more work trying to develop uh, nerve therapies for atrial fibrillation and in collaboration with my colleague Francisco Altamirano that leads the basic re research lab here at Methodist in Arrhythmia Research Lab. Uh, we started some projects that we had recently uh, NIH funded um, a few months ago, so we're super excited about this. Um, a few last things about uh, stroke prevention strategies. I mentioned blood thinners. There's kind of two broad categories of blood thinners. Warfarin is a rat poison that seemed to thin the blood and worked. And it was the only blood thinner that we had uh, for decades. And over the past decade, we've had uh, three or four, four new anticoagulants that seem to do a better job. But as I mentioned, strokes in AFib come from clots that develop in that little pouch. So what if we just close that pouch? Um, so that's called left atrial appendage closure uh, as a strategy for stroke prevention. And we have Watchman and other devices that are approved. Anyway, uh, surgeons can clip that appendage. Uh, I'll just show you one example here as to uh, how this is done. This is um, on the left, the clot that I showed earlier. And in the right is the Watchman device plugging that pouch so that clots cannot get out of there and preventing strokes. So I'll finish here, and I'm looking forward to a nice uh, session of questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Valderrama. I very much appreciate that. You know, we had a bunch of questions, as I said, come in. We've got some more coming in here, and I, I, I'm quite sure our fellows are typing furiously in the background. You know, I, I, I kind of often in these things like to put on my primary care physician hat. I always see my job as, if at all possible, keep them away from you <laughs> until they need you, right? And and obviously identify it, prevent it, et cetera. So, so if I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm a 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, whatever, listening to this, I'm like, well, how do I not get that? So what would you tell people watching this if you don't want to have heart failure? Mm -hmm. Some of it's not in your control, clearly. You've talked about genetics of that. Mm -hmm. But what can you do to prevent it? And then I'm going to ask you the same thing on AFib. Yeah, actually, you know, when the, what we found is there are really seven steps, and you'll see the AHA, they call it the simple seven of things that we can do to prevent heart failure. And it's really been have a dramatic uh, impact if we would all do them. Now, unfortunately, it's, it's you know, not the simplest things. And not so, the most fun. And always, not the most right? fun yeah. things. 
Um, but a lot of it's being active. So being physically active, um, eating healthy, uh, making sure that we're eating healthy, um, making sure that we're watching our high blood pressure and treating blood pressure when it's you know high, controlling your cholesterol, uh, making sure that you don't have diabetes, um, and then uh, looking at other factors you know in those areas. And so really, if you kind of like I said, you. It's all over there. It's the, it's the simple seven things that we're supposed to do. You know, watch your salt, exercise, watch your weight, make sure you treat the things, the risk factors uh, for high blood pressure um, really do have a huge impact. Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing these days is all of those risk factors, we're getting more and more in the United States. And so unfortunately, our job security is pretty held for right now, um, but I hope the fact that if we can, you know, reverse some of those things, we'd see the difference. So we heard a little bit about alcohol. Is there an alcohol relationship with heart failure? Not as much. Not as much. Not okay. as much. All right. So on that side, you're good. Yeah. You can't drink away, but we're going to hear some <laughs> other things here. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Dr. Valderrama, talk about, I don't want to get AFib. How do I prevent it? So what she said applies, and it applies to so many things, including atrial fibrillation. Um, being active is something that I want to make a, there's a nuance to being active and atrial fibrillation. When you exercise, you reduce your, your incidence of atrial fibrillation if you exercise in a moderate fashion. And that is very hard to quantify into specifics, but I'll just give you the extremes. Um, if you look at patients that are sedentary, highest incidence of atrial fibrillation. Patients that have intermediate, low, moderate, or intermediate levels of exercise, the incidence of atrial fibrillation goes down. Then you get into the marathon runners, the Ironman crazy athletes, atrial fibrillation goes up in those. So <coughs> I have a fair, fair amount of young patients that come to me angry. It's like, so why do I have AFib? I eat only vegetables. I exercise. I, I run seven marathons. I, I run, you know, 50 miles a week because you're overdoing it. And running... It's not as, I mean, or running or just strenuous exercise or over-exercising is a stress in the heart, pressures in the right side of the heart increase. Uh, it's not quite like apnea, but it is, a, it is a stress in the heart that actually is detrimental and particularly to the upper chambers of the heart, start stretching, and then when you have, you have scarring tissue in the, in the stretched upper chambers, you go into atrial fibrillation. So healthy lifestyle includes moderate exercise, but not excessive exercise. Got it. So uh, it's very helpful. Um, alcohol, you talked a little bit about that. A lot of it was in the context of you've got AFib and, yeah. you know, dropping the free. What, what about just, you know, going through life and having a little bit of alcohol? Is that something people need to worry about AFib as being related to that? You hear about holiday heart, some other yeah, things like that. Talk so it's extremely variable. I think um, it's a tricky one because, you know, we all like to have a glass of wine every now and then. Um, and um, sometimes there's two glasses of wine. So when is it too much? I would, I would argue that there's, there's a lot of variation as to who is susceptible to alcohol-induced atrial fibrillation. But if, the, if you're the kind of person that you drink two glasses of wine and that night you go to bed and you feel your heart like it's pounding too much, or then you know you're sensitive and mm -hmm. you should cut it. Got it. Thank you. Well, so obviously we all want to avoid it. That's really helpful advice. I, I will say I ask that in almost every session here and my primary care nagging head on. Um, I don't think I ever get an answer, you know. I mean, there's sometimes some specifics, but in almost every case, you got to get good sleep. You've got to eat well. you got to watch your, your hypertension. you got to watch your cholesterol. I mean, it's hmm. got to exercise. It's, it's really important. So, um, uh, you know, when all my friends are, you know, who are all kind of, you're younger than me, but you were mentioning at eh, 40. Um, you know, I got a lot of friends in the 50s. They're all thinking about how am I going to live a long time now? And I'm, I got to say to them, th those are the things, right, that we can do best still. Okay, so we know that. Um, what about then how I identify it early if I'm somebody? You know, you'd like to know sooner rather than later so they can get in the hands of somebody like you. What, what, are the, what would be some of the early kind of warning signs that maybe you need to be thinking about about heart failure? Yeah, I mean, honestly, when especially when we're talking about kind of the the inherited or the genetic, you know, cardiomyopathies, the warning signs your family history, um, and I think, you know, it's very interesting that I think as a society we actually don't talk to each other about our health very much, and so one of the things that I have to remind people is, not knowing that someone doesn't have it doesn't mean they don't have it, you know, and so I think that they're, you know. Um, 
learn talking with your family members getting a little bit more idea especially when you you know when you know that you know dad's been in the hospital several times and uncle bob has you know had different procedures and you know cousin mary has also seems like that she has you know you know has other things there that is a kind of key that there may be something else going on and so really i think talking with your family talking about those risk factors because again uh, we can do identification even before symptoms happen um, to potentially see who's more at risk um, I think the other thing is, like you said, of, of looking at symptoms, you know, things that we look at in heart failure is, you know, there's a difference between feeling a little shorter, shorter breath because we do stuff because we're just kind of out of shape. And as we get older, that gets easier. Um, but when you get, you know, winded, when you're just kind of walking up a flight of stairs that you have to stop and pause and like wait a little bit of time, that's not normal. You know what I mean? Also, if you start seeing episodes where, you know, we can get swelling in our legs, you know, for lots of reasons, but if we see that getting more and more, like that's also a red flag that something's going on. Um, and then also, as we talked about, you know, with Dr. V just kind of um, um, reduced exercise capacity and even palpitation. So a lot of times we see with heart failure, they'll actually, you know, feel palpitations or irregular heart rhythms too. So I'm picking up on a question I got. So if, if I if I know I've got uncle and aunt and all this kind yeah. of family history, do you have a panel of tests you can do? What In what proportion of those people can you say, aha, you have this genetic issue, that mm -hmm. genetic issue, or, or, or in what is it, what proportion is it more like, yeah, that does sound like a family history. We have to watch you closely, mm -hmm. but we can't quite pinpoint Pin, it. Right. Yeah. So in patients who do have that family history, now it, it kind of varies a little bit. So in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a family history, 70 to 80% of the time we can identify the gene. Uh, in the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy with that family history and a high clinics of suspicion, again, 50 to 60% of the time we can find the gene. And even in the dilated cardiomyopathy is in people with family history, we're up to 50%. Okay. Now, the thing I also want to stress that, however, it's important that if you come and you have the family history and we have it and we don't identify the gene, doesn't mean you don't have a hereditary or family cardiomyopathy. Just we just don't know which gene it is. Know or which if gene it's multi, it is. Exactly. Complicated. Exactly. Does knowing which gene it is matter yet? Other um, than obviously you've got some, you'll understand some of the inheritance patterns and how kids might be affected and other stuff like that. Yeah. But does it change the treatment yet? So 10 years ago, I would have said no. Today I say yes, because there's actually gene, there are actually therapies in place that we talked about, like the PKP2, the myosin binding chain protein C. Um, there's another uh, more rare disease called Dannon's disease. Um, but all of these actually have specific genetic treatments. And I think the bigger one that we didn't talk about but is a form of cardiomyopathy is actually amyloid. Um, and there's multiple therapies now that are, are a genetic base. So yeah, now it may. I mean, not all of them. Obviously, that's a small subset of all of the you know hundreds of genes that we know. Um, but yeah, for the first time, we can say it's more than just knowing risk factors, knowing other complications that may happen. We now may well be able to make specific targeted therapy because of your gene. And so how often do you find people with a genetic abnormality, but perhaps you're not one of those, but you haven't, it hasn't at least been observed in a family member previously. Are these all hereditary? Are some of them new mm -hmm. mutations? Um, you know, and now how often do you test genetics, even if there's not, hey, all these people in my family tree? Yeah. So you bring up a very important kind of genetic part of what's called a founder mutation. And so somewhere somebody had to be the first place where the the had the abnormal the ACT wrong, or G right. exactly the spell check didn't work is what I say you know because that's the thing that you know when you step back all of our genes are actually made up of four letters ACTG over and over and over and over one mess up and you can get an abnormality and so most of the time it does run in families you know what I mean and we see but there are people who that's the place where it started who have the founder mutation um, in the dilated cardiomyopathy as in the guidelines um, even if you don't have a family history, if we cannot find another reason for you to have you your heart failure, your own, we do the genetic testing. Great. Well, that's, yeah, and then of course that's very relevant to their, their you know, kids and, and other relatives perhaps Absolutely. going forward. And last question on that topic. So um, is the horse out of the barn when you start thinking of those new therapies? And you know, okay, now I'm already presenting not presenting because mm -hmm. I know grandma had it and auntie had it, but I'm presenting because I've got heart failure symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
and it's the idea that you really, really, really want to get those people before you ever, you know, when they're younger, before, you know. It's right. A, it's so, yeah, ideally, I mean, in the perfect world, yes, we'd like prevent any problems before they happen. But actually, in heart failure, um, even with our conventional medications that we see, and there's the four pillars of medications that we kind of talk about, um, we see substantial improvement. And a lot of those patients, we can actually get their heart function to normalize or at least improve. Um, and so, and then as we see some of these more specific genetic treatments, we can see regression of the disease that happened. So, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we definitely can't promise that we can get everybody's heart back to normal, um, but we can definitely see that uh, we see a lot of improvement in a lot of the patients, and a lot of them will have substantial improvement, not just in their symptoms, but actually in the structure of their heart. That's good. Okay, great. Well, so similar then. So, you know, how do you see patients present? How do they, A, how do they know? And maybe what's the, what's the most common kind of presentation when they get to you of how they've seen it? Was it a racing heart? Do they come in the first time because they had a stroke and then you find out that they had AFib, other things like that? What? It's a broad range. There's patients that never feel the AFib and it's picked up in a routine physical. There's patients that present with a stroke and they, and they are found to have AFib and they are, they are in AFib and there are patients that have a stroke and only after extensive monitoring we, see, we pick up episodes of atrial fibrillation. And then the other extreme is patients that feel every single extra bit and they feel like the heart is jumping out of their chest. Most of the patients, when you tell them um, this is AFib and this is why it's happening, then they think back and they tell you, you know what, yeah, I've had, I've had this feeling for decades, I just ignored it. So it is important to, to how do we screen, to not if to have improved methods to pick up AFib before, of course, you had a stroke. And, and there's a lot of work in, in wearables. Um, the last few years, we've seen a lot of evidence being come up um, from the Apple Watch or any other watch that can actually track your pulse and detect atrial fibrillation. Um, there's, um, of course, it will detect a lot of ex noise, a lot of, uh, you know, just the, 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 the watch is moving and you get a false reading. but. It alerts patients, and over time, they have sufficient accuracy to, to save, potentially save lives and, and prevent strokes. Um, another area that has been very, very interesting um, science coming up, looking at artificial intelligence interpretation of normal EKGs. So you go to your doctor, you get your EKG during normal rhythm. Well, a group from Mayo Clinic looked at hundreds of thousands of EKGs and looked at patients that developed atrial fibrillation decades later. And they developed an algorithm that could find features on the EKG that was in normal rhythm that were predictive of future atrial fibrillation. And that's when, that's where things really are going to change. Because if you go to your, <clears throat> to your primary care doctor when you're 30 and there's something that the algorithm picks up that alerts you, yeah. at least, I mean, you're not going to start taking blood thinners. But you might be watched a lot differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, the, so pick up on like the Apple Watch. I mean, how, how good are those? Um, you know, should we should we all have? I'm not selling Apple anything like that. Should we all have something on that? Just or is it or is it just too much false signal? Uh, so so th there is there is a lot of false positives because there's so many. So there's two things. The Apple Watch detects the pulse, and that's because your skin um, gets a little bit redder every heartbeat. Uh, so you have uh, basically a, a red light in the back of the watch and it shines light onto your skin and it measures the brightness of your skin and with every pulse, it's a little increase. So it, if, it, if it tracks over time those increases in brightness uh, and the increases are regular, then it calls it normal rhythm. And if it's irregular, it will it'll alert you. The second mechanism is using an electrode. So there's an electrode also in the back of the watch, and then with your other finger, you put it here, and now you're sampling electricity from either side of the heart. Mm -hmm. And that is what we do with a regular electrocardiogram. So that's what we call lead one. It's a lead one equivalent. And that you see your upper chamber activation, the P wave, and then the lower chamber, the QRS, and that's a real electrogram with much, much more accuracy. So I would argue that the, the best way to go about this is to have continuous pulse detection or pulse screening, and if they alert you, then get the formal uh, EKG. So you have that, or, or let's say somebody's got some symptoms and now you're monitoring them. What, what's, what's the threshold? Is like no AFib okay, or is there an amount of AFib? Like you put some three year cardi, and now, now you can implant some devices, yeah. right? You'll follow somebody's heart rate for three years if you've got some worry, or is there? you know, a brief episode that's okay, or is there no threshold of okay? How do you decide that? So, in short, we don't know. We know two things. 
any AFib is AFib. So there's no, there's no, what some patients say, mild AFib. Either you have it or you don't. We all have some runs of extra bits here and there. That's universal. Uh, we've come up with, a, with an arbitrary definition. You have to have sustained irregular activity for 30 seconds to be called AFib. So anything that less than 30 seconds, we ignore. But then once you have a fib, it could range from 31 seconds to seven hour episodes or whatever, continuous AFib. And that's where we are actively making, doing research to figure out, number one, is the risk of stroke the same whether you have one minute or two hours? And it seems like the more you have, the more risk of stroke. And the risk of stroke is not instantaneous. Like it's, you have a fib, you may have a fib for two hours, your risk of stroke continues to go high for potentially up to a month. And in any case, if you stay in normal rhythm, you go back to normal. The issue is that the upper chamber doesn't regain the, the normal strength right away after an episode of atrial fibrillation. So in short, there's, there's a lot of active research into quantifying thresholds, but to make it simple, you want zero AFib. Anything more than, than 30 seconds, we call it AFib. We all have some runs of extra beats. So not all the palpitations are AFib. That's something that's very important to understand. But if you have AFib, you have what it takes to go into AFib. It could happen anytime. Got it. Got it. Well, fascinating, fascinating conversation, both of you. I'd like, I could ask you questions. I, I think I got to, at least I try to combine and structure the things that we had kind of already selected out. I'm hoping if you all had other questions, they've, they've been furiously answered in the back and you still got time. You can still be texting because now you know what's getting asked and not. So thank you both for being here. I'm going to give you all a quick, quick uh, Houston Methodist update on a couple uh, of activities here since the last time we, we met. You know, I always talk about focusing on the fundamentals and the awards will follow, unparalleled safety, quality, service, and innovation, and you know, drive for that, and then we'll pause and celebrate the awards and move on and move to the next level. And you hear that in both these individuals, right? Because they're pushing the envelope, trying to figure out that next question in medicine, always using uh, the cutting edge. But the thing I look at the most, I've talked to you all about this before, is something called Vizient. It is a balanced scorecard. Almost every academic medical center's in it, and we all work together basically to say, listen, if you call something X, we'll define X the same, we'll measure X the same, we have processes in place to make sure we do it, as opposed to US News, all these external things which just go to some externally available database. Um, for the last, uh, I guess, what is this now, eight years, uh, they have measured community hospitals as well. And this is our trend with that. And I push not the, not the specific result here, but the fundamentals. But if you see blue, we're in the top 10%, green, the top quarter, yellow, the, the top half, and red, the bottom half, and if you see five stars, we're actually in their top, top, top group that they look at statistically. We got seven out of seven this year. We've done that once before. Uh, in terms of top 10%, we've never done that before in terms of their you know, statistically very different group. Um, really, really proud of our teams. Um, you can rest assured wherever you go in our system, you're getting amazing care. I will tell you in the community hospital setting, uh, which is five of our six community hospitals, Clear Lake is smaller, they go in a smaller group. We were the number one, two, three, four, and five. So they do this award ceremony last week, uh, and you know they count in reverse. I think there were maybe 12 or 13 in that group that got recognized, and you can imagine the room was like, wow, when they saw um, five in a row. And so very proud of those fundamentals uh, and something I think you can count on to see people like these two individuals here and many other great individuals. CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid, they measure hospitals on a diff very different setting, uh, for a five-star scale. Um, very few hospitals, like less than 10% get to five-star. We have all but one, um, and last year that one was five, so they're right. They bubbled down a little bit, but we got to six this year, so again, very proud out of them. Uh, and a couple other fun little things, you know, as I joke about always, every magazine or what used to be a magazine, uh, now their main business is making up a new survey so they can sell people that image that I just stuck on the slide. But uh, we were number 24 in the country of all employers for women. And so very proud of that. And really, really proud of this one. Second year in a row they've done this. This is Newsweek worldwide looking at smart hospitals, basically looking at digitally and innovative hospitals and digitally enabled hospitals and who's really on the leading edge of using innovation. AI, we heard a little bit about that clinically and many times in, in, in uh, uh, 
uh, delivery and other things, um, we're number 11 in the world, not, not the U.S., the world, um, out of, I think they measure about three or 400. So happy with that as well. We focus on the innovation. Again, the awards, the awards follow. A few other big updates. Um, over the last couple of months, uh, Centennial Tower is going to go way up and really fast now that it's going. We've started what we call the big pour. Um, I think it's like a thousand plus cement trucks, you know, kind of circling around and dumping t cement in and over and over again. Uh, so really cool. They spent over a year doing five miles of underground pillars basically to support this almost 30 floor building. Uh, this will open up in about four years. So we're pretty excited seeing that, seeing that moving forward. A couple big media things we had. Uh, we actually were uh, digital first and then about a month later, front page of the Sunday New York Times. Uh, those color images you see there, um, those come from us. Um, this was Houston Methodist and UCLA both featured in really looking at how do we assess lungs in COVID and some of the brutal damage. I mean, some of these pictures, go, go find this. You can Google it in a second. You'll see some, I mean, beautiful but scary images of people um, who had some of the severest. And so congratulations to our transplant team on, on working with the New York Times on, on this. And this is a Rice professor. This was uh, in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, a, an individual who had a brain tumor and almost died. I mean, just very, very close. Our team just sort of brought him back from the brink and this whole article is about that. And he's a very popular Rice professor and as is a tradition in many academic circles, really as a result of this, they vote every year. He was asked to give his quote unquote theor theoretical last lecture because of what he had experienced and really a beautiful, a beautiful story of, of someone's life um, saved by the amazing people here. And then just wrapping up a couple things. I know, uh, you know, we, we, our genesis of these meetings was COVID all the time, COVID every day. Unfortunately, it's not now, but uh, I know I get asked that every time here. So just to give you a quick update. Um, the right hand side is the city uh, kind of trend line over the years. You can see the green, which is those peaks of how much uh, is in our wastewater. Um, you can see actually the summer we got really high. It's just that everybody's got some immunity. It's probably a little milder. We weren't seeing as much illness. Uh, we got to about 125 patients across our hospital system. We're back down to about 80, 85. And viral load was peaked at around 400% this time. It's back down to 166. So we're actually on the back not done, but we're on the back end of a little surge right now. So as you're modulating your activity and risk, um, you can give that some consideration. Uh, this is what it looks like from a hospital perspective throughout the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, pandemic. You can see we kind of know that pattern now. And if you remember last month, I told you we're still on the way up, but I don't think we're too much farther to go. And that thankfully it had been mild. And I think it's, it's come out pretty much the way we kind of can project it right now. So if you're thinking about vaccines, I know I get a ton of questions always about that. The COVID booster came out. This is a more specific booster now this fall. Um, you know, if you are immunocompromised 100%, you need to get it now. And then everybody else absolutely should get it if you're in a risk group, which is basically almost everybody, uh, but certainly the older you get. But there's some sweet spot timing you always want to think about, right? If, it, if you've had COVID within the last three, four months, you had your last shot within the last three, four months, you might wait a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I personally try to always time it a little bit for like when I think a surge is coming, we're on the backside, but there's still a lot of it out there. So I'd encourage you to go get it, especially if you have any risk. Flu season, go get it. October is usually the sweet spot there. So you don't miss the back end when your immunity starts to wane. And a new one out there, if you're 60 and up, or if you're immunocompromised this year, is exciting. It's an RSV, uh, respiratory syncytial virus uh, vaccine. This affects the tiny, tiny little kiddos, and it affects 60 and up. So this is me putting my primary care hat on. I promise you all my, my patients who are 60 and up are getting this speech, and um, we're trying to get them this because it causes pretty severe respiratory illness the older you get. And when we can prevent severe illness, that's a good thing. And that's why vaccines are, are so amazing. There, there's one about to come out for pregnant women that'll probably uh, pass through the placenta and protect uh, the babies. And there's actually a, a, a drug infusion now for uh, newborns that can prevent that because you can't, they're too young to get a vaccine. You can't really get that immune response. So a little advice there, and I'm going to close things up. Thank again, everybody be, for being here. Thank the two fellows who've been online as well. Um, that's been so very, very helpful. Um, we will have our next session and uh, very much look forward to seeing you. I think it's on a Tuesday instead of our normal Thursday. We'll be sending out information and we'll look forward to seeing you then. That'll be, I think, number 40. Uh, it's amazing to see how many of these we've done and we enjoy them every time. So thank you for being with us.